Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for another day that you have given us, and I thank you that we as Christians have the privilege to be able to gather together freely uh, as believers to encourage one another, to build one another up, to in- stimulate each other to love, to good deeds, and I pray that that is something that we actively do uh, among ourselves as a body of Christians and a body of people who have put their faith and trust in you. I thank you that we get to come to you but in prayer, and we get to stand before you in confidence, not in what we have done, but in what your son has done for us and dying on the cross and resurrecting three days later. And that through our faith in that, we can come before you with any request, any concern, any need that we have, knowing that you hear it and knowing that we can trust you to take care of it. And so I thank you for this immense privilege that you've given us. And I pray that we continually use it, not just in church, but week by week and day by day. I want to bring those before you who are uh, sick in our church, especially those with COVID-19, and especially uh, Chris and her husband as they are at the ER. I pray that you would give the doctors wisdom who are taking care of that, and that you would be with Chris and her husband, uh, and that they would be able to come through this stronger, uh, that they would be able to come through this with a greater faith and a, a testimony of their own faith towards those who are treating them. I pray for those who have uh, less dire situations in regarding to COVID. I pray that they would make wise decisions, uh, that they would not go out of their way to interact with people or to cause the spread, uh, but that they would take it upon themselves to protect others while they are going through their quarantine time, and that you would bring healing to them, and that you would help them to recover from it, and you would keep the church safe uh, from any other additional cases as time goes on. I pray for those who are in mourning over the loss of a loved one. I pray that we as a church family would come around them and comfort them, love on them, encourage them, and that they would be able to feel your peace and your presence through this hard time uh, throughout the entire family. I pray that uh, for the nation, it is a a nation that is falling farther and farther away from you every day. And so I pray that uh, whether it is judgment that is coming or whether your grace will push it back, Uh, Whatever it is, that we would be trusting you, and that through whatever comes past the election and and going into the years upcoming with COVID, with the election, with all of this stuff going on all at once, that we would be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, that we would be in both word and action, examples of you loving on others in our community, loving on those who are our enemy, and that we would be a shining light to a very, very dark world, especially during a very, very dark time such as this. And so give us the strength to do that. Give us the faith to do that. Help us to trust in you in our daily walk as we go forward day to day. I pray now as we go into a time of worship that you would quiet our hearts, quiet our minds. You would remove the distractions that pull us away from worshiping you and that we would be able to focus on the words, focus on who you are, what you have done, what you have promised you will do, and how great and how wonderful you absolutely are, especially to us. And I pray that that would be the truth that sits into our hearts, and as we hear from your word, we will be able to find something to apply in our own lives so that we may grow more like your son, Jesus Christ. I pray all these things in your name. Amen.
Thank you, Sharon and Mr. May. The 10 event was a wonderful night. Now, I do feel the need to explain why my wife and I brought a camper to a tent event. Now, we have two teens who are a part of the tent event, and one of them was able to stay in a tent with one of their friends, but our only tent was used by our son. So we had to use our camper. Now, whether or not I needed to plug it into the outlet so we had power and heat, that's a little, that was because of me. But, um, but no, it was a wonderful time. We had a great time. And Nick was being gracious because I was supposed to stay up until 2, 2.30. But sometime around like 1, one fifteen, I fell asleep. And, um, and, and he knew it because he told my wife that I didn't move for a while. I guess the more concerning fact is nobody came and checked on me, but, uh, but I was okay. I woke up around uh, 2.30 and then went over and told Nick I was going to bed, which he already knew I'd fallen asleep. Um, but no, it was a great time. The teens had a blast. We, um, you know, the, the message Nick preached was, was wonderful, and, uh, and I think the teens really enjoyed this. Um, now, my next thoughts going forward is to have Greg fly his drone over so he can take a picture of the property so we can start dividing it out into quadrants for capture the flag. Because kids had flashlights and they went off into the, and you couldn't see the flashlight. Like, they went across the parking lot and they were gone. And they had flashlights. You couldn't see this. I'm walking around this place. I didn't realize how big it was. It was absolutely just tremendously huge. And so, uh, yeah, we could have about 150 people here. Uh, but it was a blessing, and we do thank you for your prayers. And, um, and one last announcement. I missed it last week, but our uh, pre-Kers up to sixth graders, when the choir is finished singing their song today, you guys are going to go back uh, with Miss Sue to practice. Okay? And, uh, and for the younger ones, you'll go to class. But um, we're going to open up our singing. I'm going to ask you to stand with us as we open up our singing with Ancient of Days. Amen. And we'll continue singing with Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
the victor's crown. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we continue singing, Breathe on me, breath of God. God, we thank you, Lord, that you breathed life into us. And because of your son, Jesus Christ, who wears the victor's crown, that we can have eternal life. Father God, I pray that you would just bless this day. I pray, Lord, that you would just touch hearts and that if there's someone here with us today that doesn't have that special relationship with you, Lord, that you would just come down and convict their heart, Lord, and that today would be the day of their salvation. Father God, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your loving kindness. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Thank you. Please be seated. Pastor Larry informed us this morning, um, the song that we're going to sing today is called There Was Jesus, and uh, Pastor Larry informed us this morning that uh, last night at Glory's party, he was uh, with his family, and your brother, was it? His cousin. uh, Asked him if he ever heard this song, and uh, they started playing it, and it just so happened to be this song, There Was Jesus, and Pastor Larry had never heard it before, and... um, And so the Lord works in ways we can never fully understand. And um, and we should know and rest assured in that the Lord always has our best in mind. And even though we may not see it, he's always working. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand, I start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus 
When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces This man who needs amazing kind of grace For forgiveness and a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day There was Jesus There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing Blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it. There was Jesus on the mountains, in the valleys, there was Jesus in the shadows of the alleys. Thank you for preparing our hearts for that, that incredible song. Father, we've heard sung that our Savior wears the victor's crown. Father, we know from your promises that you never leave us nor forsake us. And as we look back on our lives as believers, Lord, I know that in every moment, every hour, if we look and we wondered how we got through the day, how we got through the trial, we can see that there was Jesus. Now speak once again through your living word, we ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you take your Bibles with me this morning and Turn to the book of James. We're continuing our study here in this marvelous letter to the churches. And we're in James chapter 4. James chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 7 to 10 this morning. 7 to 10. Now, just as a review, James had sternly rebuked his readers for their friendship with the world back in verses 4 and f- four through 6. And uh, remember, he called them in verse 4, you adulteresses. In other words, they had, he's talking about those believers 
and we're all guilty of it at one time or another in our life, where the world be, <clears throat> becomes so important to us, we get immersed in their system, in, the, in what they say we ought to buy into, and the pleasures, and then all of a sudden, we are become enemies of God if, if we are living in the world in the way of lifestyle, in the way of my mindset, in the way of values. And so, basically, we're all fallen sinners. We're saved by grace. But we looked at God's marvelous grace last week. Greater grace. The grace that is greater than all our sin. And the daily grace that He gives you and me to be able to face sin and, and uh, resist sin as well as walk in obedience before the Lord and the grace that will give us strength in the deepest, darkest night. Well, God then, uh, Paul, uh, James then says that God opposes the proud. Opposes the proud. So we come now to verse 7. And now I believe in verse 7 to 10, we actually are given by James the keys to victorious Christian living. I think it can all be summed up right here because this pretty much says it all. How do I live a victorious Christian life? Well, James says, first of all, verse 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So here he is saying submit to God first. That's the first commandment. Do we want a victorious life? It begins here. Now we are all in a battle with God's enemy, Satan. Who is our enemy as well because we've become the children of God. And so you have a target on your back. And Satan knows who you are, that you are God's child. And so he is going to do everything he can, scheme his way to bring you down, to bring me down. Whether through sin, whether through accusations, whether through discouragement, through get, wanting to give up. Maybe you're feeling that way today. That, and, and Satan just keeps pounding in your mind, pounding in your mind these thoughts that says, go ahead, God's not there. God's not keeping his promises. God's not listening to your prayers. So, so just, just go on your own and just give up throwing the towel. And so sad today, uh, we're seeing more and more people, even young people, commit suicide. And especially with this COVID crisis. Uh, people don't know what to do. And so James is saying, do you want victory over the, the enemy, the devil? Here it is. Now, notice he doesn't start with just resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You know, we, we use that phrase and heard it used before. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's powerful stuff. We're going to look at that. But we forget what's said before that. And I cannot resist the devil and go up against him in my life, unless I first submit to God. That's where it all starts. If I think that I can do battle, a spiritual battle, with my spiritual enemy, and think I'm going to come out victorious, and I'm not submitting to God first, I'm going to find myself a defeated Christian. First, submit, he says. Submit. The word submit in the Greek literally means to align oneself under the authority of another. To align oneself under the authority of another. Those of you who have been in the military, and uh, uh, Jim May, thank you for your marvelous trumpet playing today and last week. You're just blessing my heart. I know you're blessing everyone else, but uh, I should be calling him Colonel James May. Because some of you don't know that, but he's a colonel. He was a colonel. Was it Army? Marines. Army. Yes, Army. And of course, he was in the band, but uh, he was a chaplain in the Army. And, uh, but 
when, when I think of uh, men like him, uh, Colonel having to give orders, uh, the, the, what did the, the men under you have to do? They had to submit, right? Parents, how about the kids? Hey, kids, uh, do you always obey your parents every time, all the time? Yeah? Go ahead, no, 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 we don't, no, when we were growing up, nope. And that's why you get punished, that's why discipline comes, right? Because we have our selfish will, we have that will that gets in the way and says, no, I don't want to do it, I want to do it my way. And James is saying, church, you better lay down your will and take up God's will. And that's what submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is all about. I have got to make a a choice that I'm going to let Jesus be and control my life and I will live in obedience to His Lordship. And if I don't, then I am not submitting to God here. And then I'm going to fall on my face and I'm going to fall because of sin, because of pride, all these other things that are going to happen. So he says here, submit. So submit first, Christian. And then, Paul, uh, then John, James says, resist the devil. Resist the devil. That also is a military term. The word submit is military term in the Greek. And also, so is the word resist, which means to oppose or stand against. So we are to resist the devil. Back in the 70s, And uh, now I'm really dating myself, right? Back in the 70s, anybody remember Flip Wilson? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Flip Wilson, he was a comedian. And uh, and he was made famous for a line he always used on television when he would play, do some some of his mimes and things. Anybody remember what it was? That's it. Ask the 80-year-old over here. Yep, the devil made me do it. That's what he would say all the time. The devil made me do it. Guess what? The devil can't make you do anything. The devil doesn't make me do anything. If I sin, that is my responsibility. I have an enemy that's going to try and tempt me to sin. But he cannot force me to sin. Therefore, if I know that, I have the Lord Jesus and his strength I can resist the devil, take a firm stand, right? And if I take that firm stand, it says there, he will flee from you. He'll run. The only way I can get Satan to run from me after he's attacking me is I've got to first submit my will to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Humble myself before the Lord. And then take a stand in the armor of God. And then the victory is promised. This victory, of course, is based upon the work that Christ did on the cross for all of us on our behalf. Satan was defeated at the cross and at the empty tomb. And so therefore, he's running around doing guerrilla warfare, but he's he's a loser. He's lost. He's lost the battle, but God still allows him freedom under the sovereign will of God, to still, still attack the, the, the people of God. But uh, turn to Ephesians uh, 6 with me real quick. Ephesians 6, uh, here is that familiar passage, but I, I think it's important that we just take a quick look at it here. Uh, Ephesians 6, this is what Paul spoke spoke of when he, concerning the armor. And look at verse 10. Ephesians 6, beginning of verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of whose might? His might. I'm going to fight the enemy with his power and strength because I have submitted myself to God, as James said. Put on the full or whole armor of God, verse 11, that you may be able to stand firm. There it is. That's the resisting that James is talking about. Paul's saying here, stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers and against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the high places. And therefore, because of this, because there is an unseen, you know, we think that, that the, the unseen virus is the biggest enemy. It's not. It's not that. Our biggest invisible enemy is Satan himself. And he works on the mind. His battlefield is the mind. And he wants to get us to doubt God and live in fear. But he says, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist. There's that word again. Resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in addition to all that, taking up the shield of faith, that's believing in every word God, God has given us and every promise, and trusting in Him. Taking up the shield of faith with, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. He's shooting at you today. Those missiles are coming. But you have an armor, invisible armor to put on today that will help you daily Resist the devil, and then he'll flee from you. Take the helmet of salvation, verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here is that armor. This is a spiritual battle, my friends. We must understand. And uh, turn uh, to 1 Peter. Let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. And so Peter, and Peter also spoke of our enemy and the battle we are in, each one of us as believers. 1 Peter 5, beginning of verse 6. And we're going to see again uh, when we go back to our passage in James uh, that we are to humble ourselves before God. But verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That you may be, that he may exalt you at the proper time, and we love verse seven, casting all your anxiety or cares upon him, because he cares for you. Isn't that beautiful? It begins with submitting myself to the lordship of Jesus Christ, submitting myself humbly before him, taking my anxiety, my worries, and casting them upon the Lord. That means to just throw them on the Lord. But then look at verse 8. Be of so, sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Saying the same thing James does. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering. Remember, Satan brings suffering against you and me. Where do you find that? Well, look at the book of Job. And you will see J Satan was allowed to bring that, that suffering and affliction on Job. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, many of you know that we've got a puppy. Uh, but um, it's a, a white Samoyed. Uh, and Grandpa in Canada uh, helped uh, uh, purchase it for us. And uh, this dog is no puppy anymore. It's a, how, how, how many? Five months old? Five months old, but it's getting huge. And, and if you know the Samoyed, it's the Samoyed, it, basically it's one of, the, one of those dogs that, that really traces back to the wolf. It's got... A lot of wolf instincts. It's a herd animal. So it chases after everything. Well, Sh Sharon was taking uh, S Sasha, is her name, for a walk the other day. And, uh, and all of a sudden she ran over and pulled Sharon and, and she grabbed something off the ground. And, and Sharon uh, pulls her back and sees that Sasha has something in her mouth. Well, what is that? And so Sharon goes over to the dog and, Sasha, what do you got in your mouth? Let go, let go. Here was a giant mouse. And, 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 and in, in the, now was, it, was the mouse dead, honey? Or alive? 
No, it was dead. Okay. And she, she doesn't want me to tell this story. Cause, but I, I didn't ask before I'm telling this. Um, so I'm going to get in trouble. I'm already in the doghouse uh, then. Um, <laughs> but anyway, she, suddenly Sharon's got to get this mouse out, uh, mouse out of her mouth. And so she's reaching and let go, let go. Well, this dog, because of that wolf instinct, just, no, I'm not letting go. And suddenly she just has to try and pry her jaws open and grab the mouse and pull it. Suddenly the mouse spurts blood everywhere, hands, everything. And she, she still got it. And so I, I know this is, uh, lunch is still a half hour away, so you'll be fine. But, but she had to finally get that mouse out and then walk the rest of the way home covered in blood. You know, and as I thought of that, I think of the enemy, Satan, who wants to devour you and devour me. He, he wants to chew you up and spit you out. But guess what? We can resist the enemy through this power of the Lord Jesus Christ because he wears the victor's crown. Amen? He wears the victor's crown, and I don't have to run in fear of the devil. Yes, I'm, I must, I cannot underestimate Satan and his power. He's powerful. But I don't want to overestimate him either. So let's go back to James chapter 4. And he goes on now. This, these are the keys to a victorious Christian life. Look at verse 8. Then he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Man, he's throwing out some strong, uh, you know, exhortation here. But what's the next step to victory? There it is. Draw near to God. He's commanding his readers who may be involved in the world and really been enticed by the world that they have been pulled away from the Lord. So he's basically saying, get back to the Lord. Draw near to the Lord, and what will happen? He will draw near to you. You know, we've got a lot of songs that we sing that are, um, come near to me, Lord, uh, be closer to me. Uh, you know, I, where are you? I need you nearer to me. <laughs> right here, James is saying, we don't need to ask God to come nearer. I have to choose to get nearer to Him. And as I choose to get nearer to Him, guess what? He'll come running. He will draw near to us as we seek Him and draw near to Him. How important it is that we understand this truth. How do we draw near to Him? Turn to John 15 real quick. The Gospel of John 15. Jesus is in the upper room with His disciples. Verse 1. And as He speaks to them, He speaks of the vine and the branches. And you, you know all about this passage. But He says to His disciples, and He's saying to you and me today, this morning, he says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. In other words, you're saved. So he's talking to his disciples who are believers, right? But now he tells them to do something. Verse 4, it commands them, Abide in me, and I in you. For the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, what's the rest? You can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here it is. What is drawing near to God? It's abiding in Christ. 
I'm choosing to go before the Lord and, and I'm drawn to draw close to Him in my life. And that means first I'm submitting to the Lord, submit my will, submit myself to His authority and His Word. So that when I live my life daily, I am saying, Lord, it's out there. The world's tempting me. I have, the, the t- I have my old, old nature in here that wants to do evil, wants to do its own thing. Lord, help me. I give my will to you. And as we do that, spend time in God's Word and walk with Him daily. Just walking as if you could see Him next to you. And talk to Him that way all day long. What are you doing? You're getting the mind of Christ because you have the Word of God hidden in your heart. And suddenly, you will find that you are drawing closer and closer to God. Just as James says. And by drawing closer to God, guess what? You are going to sense His closeness more and more and more through His Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is going to let you know that you are there because suddenly you're going to start experiencing joy. You're going to start experiencing peace that passes all understanding and contentment in life. And all that comes when I when I am abiding in the Lord and I draw near to the Lord. So let's go back and let's look at what else does James say about victory. Victory for the Christian's life. Draw near to the Lord. The rest of verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse your hands. He's, now this is basically... Uh, This is a picture that is drawn from ceremonial cleansing in the Old Testament. We're not going to take time to look at it. But uh, this is speaking of spiritual cleansing. You know, Jesus talked to his disciples in John chapter 13. He basically told them when Jesus got the towel and the bowl and he was going to wash their feet. And Peter said, no way, Lord, you're not going to touch my feet and wash them. And, you, and Jesus says, Peter, you won't have any part of me if you don't let me do it. And then Peter says, okay, Lord, then give me a whole bath. Give me a whole bath. And Jesus said to him, he said, and spoke, speaking to the rest of the disciples, he said, you don't need a whole bath. You've got that. You're already saved. And that's speaking of salvation. You've been washed in the blood. You're bathed. But he said, but your feet are dirty. Now, Jesus was talking about the feet. He said, but your feet need to be washed every day. And he was talking about the believer who is saved. We don't need a bath anymore, spiritual bath, but we, need, we get our hands dirty, don't we? And they've got to be cleaned spiritually. When I, when I sin during the day, I have those evil thoughts, dwell on them, or I have a bad attitude, I lash out at somebody, or I'm angry, or my at my wife, or or my kids, and and uh, I, I something that I know displeases God. Uh, suddenly, I realize I've got to confess that, and and at this point, I have got to understand that I need my hands clean. So that's what First John one nine is all about. If we confess our sins, He is what. Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, uh, I always tell you, that, that's uh, uh, the Christian's bar of soap. And so then <clears throat> he goes on and he calls them, you sinners. And that's pretty powerful stuff. But he's saying, you still have the sin nature in you guys. You, you still, you know, we admit it that you're saved, but we're sinners saved by grace. Then he says, purify your heart, you double-minded. And he used that word double-minded back in chapter 1. Remember that? He talked about double-minded person, Christian, uh, when it comes to prayer and going before the Lord and asking Him for wisdom. But then we come to verse 9. He says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, the, the, boy, when you read that, you go, you mean we're supposed to be miserable Christians? Now, basically, many times we just are miserable, right? During the day, because of the way things are going, and I'm just, it, everything seems against me. I, you know, I, I'll feel miserable, I'll be gloomy. But what's he talking about here? He's talking about 
the Christian who is insensitive to sin. That if I am not abiding in Christ, submitting to the Lord, and drawing near to Him, then guess what? Suddenly, I, I, I will not feel a sensitivity to sin. So when I sin, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't, suddenly don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit because I will resist that Spirit if I'm not walking closely with the Lord. But if I'm walking close to the Lord, suddenly I'll get the conviction of the Holy Spirit that I've sinned, and that's the point where I have to just confess my sin and He will forgive us. But what He's saying is, take sin seriously, Christian. Stop laughing or in thinking. You can just go ahead and by God's grace, you can just sin all you want. He says, but I want you to be miserable, mourn, and weep over that sin. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom. And I have to ask myself this question. And you and I all both have to ask it. When was the last time I wept over my sin? Think about it. Think about that. When was the last time that I wept over sin that I did against God? I know I don't do enough weeping for my sin. And I don't realize what it's doing to the heart of God and how I'm bringing Him hurt and pain and grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I, we, 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 we've glossed over sin. and We don't call sin, sin anymore. We call it a mistake, right? Oh, a mistake. Or, uh, and, and, and so therefore, we're not calling it what God calls it. And the Lord is speaking to me on this, that I have got to get to the place where I start weeping and crying over my sin when I, when I sin against Him. And then look at verse 10. He then says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. There's the, the last key to a victorious Christian life, humbling ourselves before the Lord. Back in verse 6, James says, and he quoted Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And James goes back to it. Unless I am walking in humility before God and realize what kind of, who I am, that I'm a, a wretched sinner saved by grace, I have nothing to throw my chest out about. I boast in the cross of Christ, not in myself. But the problem is, we so easily start boasting in ourselves, don't we Christians? But God won't, won't minister to our hearts and give us victory if I'm walking around with a proud heart and I don't humble myself before the Lord and he says, if you humble yourself before the Lord in the presence of the Lord, there's going to be a time where he is going to exalt you. He is going to exalt you. Jesus said who, in Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. God lifts up the humble heart, and he will lift you up, dear friend as you walk in humility before the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. The secret to victory this week. Take this passage, dear Christian, this week, and, and just say, okay, Lord, I, I'm going to take this with me this week, Lord, and I want to follow these principles. And I want to submit to you first. So then I can take a stand against the wiles of the enemy, Satan, I'll resist him, he will flee from me. And then I begin to walk in such a way where I'm, I'm drawing near to God in my, my spiritual walk, cleaning my hands, which means confessing my sin daily, and then making sure I'm humble before him. Watch what happens in your life. Watch how God is going to bless your life and you will enjoy the great, uh, blessings and uh, riches of the Lord Jesus Christ because you've surrendered yourself to Him. Let's do that. Let's pray together. This morning, dear believer, perhaps,
perhaps you realize that you've been living lately a defeated life. Satan's got you right where he wants you. And he's working on your heart. And you kind of just kind of walked away from the Lord. You're wondering, why do I have all this trouble? And I, and I don't have peace. I don't have victory. Perhaps you need to follow these principles. Would you commit to the Lord now? Say, Lord, this week, I want to start submitting to you, your Lordship. And I want you to empower me and help me to resist the enemy and give me victory. Lord, I want to draw closer to you and I plan to do it. I'm going to come to your word and read it and live it. And then, Father, I humble myself before you today. Would you do that, Christian? Make that commitment. If you're here without Christ, You've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. I invite you right now to open your heart and receive Him by faith. If you understand that simple gospel, Jesus went to the cross for you. He died in your place for your sins. He took your sins upon Himself. And the punishment He he endured on the cross was the punishment you and I deserve. But He died for your sins that you could go free. All you must do, though, is first believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then you will be saved. And that means accepting His forgiveness at the cross. And then you begin to walk a life of obedience. Do you want to make that decision to follow Christ? To become His very own? If so, then pray with me now with our heads bowed. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. I believe You died on that cross for me and took the punishment for my sin. Come into my life right now and wash my sins away. I receive you today as my very own Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the dead, Lord Jesus. And with head still bowed, if you gave your heart to Christ, you now are His child. You've been forgiven. You've been born again spiritually, born into the family of God. Welcome to his family. Father, thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts once again. I pray that these decisions that are made today in our hearts might be real. We might stand by them, Lord, and we know that you will bring us the victory, Father, that you promised as we submit ourselves to you. And we'll thank you for what you do as we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. My dear friend, uh, as we are about to close, if you made a decision as a believer, any kind of decision concerning uh, what the Lord has been speaking to you about, you need to lay a burden down before the Lord, or you just want to take today to say, yes, Lord, I'm submitting to your Lordship. This altar is open for you. As we sing, I invite you to come down front and pray here and give it to the Lord. Make that commitment public. And if you accepted Christ as your Savior today, I invite you to step out of your seat as we sing, come down front, and I'll meet you here at the cross. I'd like to welcome you into the family of God. Would you come as we sing? Before we close our service, I'm going to ask Pastor Larry if uh, when I'm praying to close, if you could just stay here because we have okay. something for you. And so we, we won't dismiss directly after the prayer. Um, but uh, we're going to close our service today with In His Presence. So please stand as we sing In His Presence. <laughs>
God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, and we thank you, Father God, for your loving kindness. Lord, I pray that you would just be with us, Lord, this week. And Father God, I thank you for Jonestown Bible Church. I thank you for um, just having a place to come and worship, Lord, and that we'll get the truth week in and week out. Father God, I pray that you would be with us now. Help us and watch over us, and we thank you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.